Good morning. Welcome to an online event brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles and Abbott. Today, we're going to hear the latest advances in deep brain stimulation, DBS, and other treatments for Parkinson's. I'm Joe Moeller. I serve on the board of directors. For those of you who don't know us, we're a nonprofit that supports families living with Parkinson's through educational events like this, support groups, meetings, and more. Today's program is brought to you by our event sponsor, Abbott. Abbott and by the donations from the Parkinson's community. If you appreciate what we do, please donate as you are able. You can find a link on our website, which is pcla.org. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Dr. Camille Malat. She is an assistant professor of neurology and an associate program director of neurology residency at Cedar sinai Medical Center. She completed her neurology residency at UCLA and Movement Disorders Fellowship at Cedar sinai Dr. Malat's clinical expertise includes Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinson's syndromes and deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease and dystonia. She is actively involved in clinical trials for Parkinson's at Cedar sinai Everyone, please welcome Dr. Malat. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. So today, uh, I'm going to be talking about therapeutic advancements in Parkinson's. I am going to focus on DBS, but I also will cover um, medications as well, and uh, also some advancements kind of in clinical trials. There are a few questions that were sent in that I'll try to address um, at the end as well. So today, I'm going to be talking about basics of Parkinson's disease, typical symptoms, how it's diagnosed, how motor symptoms are treated from a medication standpoint, and then as well as DBS. Parkinson's disease, in terms of prevalence, these numbers are probably underestimations, but there are about 7 to 10 million patients worldwide, 1 million in the U.S., and about 60,000 new diagnoses per year. We expect that these numbers are only going to increase um, with the aging population. People are living longer, and so it's going to become an even more prevalent issue. Overall, you know, the typical age of onset really is around like 60 to 65. First symptom is variable. You know, there we classically think of Parkinson's and rest tremor, but there are plenty of patients that don't have rest tremor either. In general, it's kind of a slowly progressive disorder. Um, tends to be more common in men. Most of the time, um, it is idiopathic, meaning that we don't know what the cause is. Although in general, we kind of expect that there's a combination of genetics and environment involved. The, the numbers that can actually be attributed to specific genes are about 10% in general. We really don't know what the initiating factor is in Parkinson's disease, what really triggers the disease. But we do know that a very important component of the disease is loss of dopamine producing cells in the brain. Dopamine is very important in a number of different circuits in the brain, obviously one of them being movement, but also, you know, the reward circuit also involves dopamine. And this is, uh, this picture is kind of just showing an example of what we usually use to help diagnose it, which is dot scan which is looking at um, uptake of a specific tracer and it's representative of existing dopamine producing neurons in the brain. So as you can see in, for the normal patient, it's very bright, has this kind of nice kidney bean shape. Um, and in the patient with Parkinson's, you can see that the shape is kind of lost. It's a little bit less bright, meaning that there's been degeneration a lot of these dopamine producing cells within the brain. So when we think of Parkinson's, these are kind of the hallmark symptoms. And a lot of the time we can actually make the diagnosis clinically with just an examination. I don't need to order any further tests like the DAT scan that I showed you. So the, the kind of classic triad is resting tremor, but again, some patients don't have resting tremor, um, stiffness or rigidity, and then slowness of movement or bradykinesia. And in order to make the clinical diagnosis or to meet clinical criteria, you need two out of the three. Interestingly, by the time you even notice any motor symptoms, 60 to 80% of the dopamine producing cells are already lost. Some other symptoms that we typically see in Parkinson's are you know, masked face, uh, softness of the voice, um, and things that we tend to notice a little bit later on in more advanced disease are things like impairment of balance, issues with walking, freezing with walking, uh, difficulty swallowing. And uh, there are also non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which are extremely important, things that should be addressed at every visit. Oftentimes, they're actually more debilitating than the motor symptoms, um, especially later on in the disease. Various categories that are typically involved are neuropsychiatric symptoms, so depression and anxiety, uh, cognitive impairment, which can range from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. Sleep is something that is very, very commonly affected in Parkinson's, different types of sleep dysfunction, including 
issues staying asleep, actually more commonly than falling asleep. Sleep apnea is really common. And then REM, REM behavior disorder, where patients act out their dreams. Oftentimes, these issues with sleep can cause fatigue, or fatigue can occur independently of that. Um, loss of smell is very common. And then also autonomic symptoms. So the autonomic nervous symptom, uh, nervous system uh, controls a lot of the kind of automated things that occur in the body, like breathing and and heart rate and blood pressure, things that you don't consciously have to think about to control. And so when that's impaired, symptoms such as constipation occur, uh, urinary symptoms, uh, orthostatic hypotension, which is basically drops in blood pressure when, when you stand, those are very common symptoms as well. There's kind of a, I just, I really like this slide because it shows you kind of the progression of symptoms, both motor and non-motor over time. And as you may notice, a lot of these symptoms actually, a lot of the non-motor symptoms, or sometimes we call them kind of prodromal features or pre-motor symptoms, show up before the onset of tremor or any other motor symptoms. Things like REM behavior disorder, um, which is the, again, the acting out of dreams, uh, loss of smell, constipation, these things can really show up even decades before onset of any motor symptoms. Also depression and anxiety as well. And then things that kind of show up Later on in the disease and more advanced disease, um, from a motor standpoint, are motor fluctuations and dyskinesias, which we will talk a lot about um, because a lot of our advanced therapies are targeting those issues. Difficulty swallowing, balance issues, and then from the non-motor side, cognitive issues become more prominent later on in the disease as well. And these things are really important to look at because, um, you know, potentially if we can kind of capture this subset of patients um, that have these early pre-motor, non-motor uh, non symptoms, you know, those would be really good candidates for clinical trials um, in our search for kind of disease-modifying therapies. So in terms of diagnosis, um, as I said, it can be made purely clinically um, based on examination. Another thing that we tend to look at is whether patients respond to medications. So in typical Parkinson's, patients will notice a good response to the medication. If they don't, then that kind of uh, encourages us to search for, you know, other types of Parkinson's or atypical Parkinson's to see if there's some other cause instead of just plain old typical Parkinson's. And then when I am not sure clinically, um, you know, maybe the patient uh, doesn't totally meet clinical criteria. If there's any question, I, I will get a DAT scan because that's quite sensitive and specific as well. And that's really helpful to make a diagnosis. In terms of managing Parkinson's disease, there are a lot of different aspects to that. So Diet is really important. So in terms of studies, Mediterranean diet is really great. And Mediterranean diet, um, you may or may not be familiar with, but in general, includes a lot of vegetables and fruits, healthy fats. So things like nuts, avocado, kind of a minimizing red meat and eating more like seafood, uh, chicken and things like that. And also avoiding like processed foods, eating more like whole grains. And that has actually been shown to reduce the risk of developing Parkinson's, developing neurodegenerative disorders, um, as well as cardiovascular disease. And I'll talk a little bit more about actually like the microbiome and bacteria and like that a little bit later at the end. And exercise is extremely important. It is the only thing we know that actually may slow the progression of the disease, and that's been shown in, in a few studies. Usually, I recommend different types of exercise, so one being aerobic exercise, another thing being stretching, and then strength training as well. I can say, again, not only in the studies, but anecdotally, that my patients that exercise a lot um, and kind of incorporate that into their daily lifestyle um, they tend to do well. They tend to progress more slowly than other patients in general. And then medications, which we will talk about, and then advanced therapies like DBS, which I will also talk about. Um, this is just kind of illustrating, you know, over time, kind of the new medications that have been, you know, established for Parkinson's disease. In general, the mainstay of treatment is still levodopa, basically our oldest and best medication, most effective medication. And the medications that have been developed since then, um, in general, are formulation, different formulations of carbidopa levodopa or their adjunct, uh, adjunctive medications. So medications to be used in addition to kind of uh, enhance the effect of, of levodopa. And I'll go through and try to highlight, especially some of the newer medications. Um, in general, in early Parkinson's disease, Patients respond well to medication. And really, even this slide isn't totally accurate, I think, because a lot of patients don't even have any ups and downs. Patients may miss doses of medication and, 
and they may not even notice. So they tend to just respond well to the medication without many issues. And then in more advanced disease, um, patients do develop a lot of issues with medication. So for some reason, um, the, the brain cells that produce dopamine that are still existing, they just become kind of more sensitive to the medications. They become more sensitive to the dopamine. So basically patient will take the medicine and it'll be very effective. It might even be a little bit too effective. So they develop dyskinesias. Um, they, they move almost too much. And then the medication just doesn't last as long. And so that wears off early. People can experience, you know, sudden offs, unpredictable offs, off periods. You know, sometimes the medication doesn't kick in at all. So there's a lot of different issues that come up uh, and it can be very difficult to control. Just wanted to show kind of an example of patient on, off and with dyskinesia. So as you can see, he does still have a little bit resi of residual tremor, but clearly is, is moving really well. And then now he is, he is more off. So he kind of has that what we call a classic reemergent tremor. And uh, he's kind of taking smaller steps, just less mobile in general. And then this is an example of this patient's dyskinesia. As you can see, he kind of has these wiggly dance-like movements that are involuntary. And most commonly dyskinesias occur when on. Um, so at peak dose, maybe you know an hour or two after taking medication, but they can actually also occur when off. Which is why it's really important um, to keep track of your symptoms. And it will be really helpful for, you know, when you see your physician, for them to know like, what do you experience when you're on? What do you experience when you're off? in relation to dosing of medication, when is on time occurring and when is off time occurring, when is dyskinesia occurring, so that we can appropriately adjust medications. Usually, you know, my initial step will be to potentially increase or decrease the actual dose, the milligrams per dose. I can also kind of adjust space, the time intervals closer together. Those are kind of the initial first steps in terms of trying to work with these motor fluctuations. So it's really important to have really good notes. It's very helpful. And then, you know, there are like, as I talked about, there are other formulations of levodopa. So these are some things that, you know, we turn to when we start having these issues with motor fluctuations. So I usually start with just like an immediate release tablet. That's kind of, again, our mainstay of treatment. And it seems to be the most effective. So that's what I usually start with. And then I may adjust the dose. I may adjust the timing interval as well. But there are other formulations, um, extended release tablet, there's also Ritari, which is a gel capsule, and that tablet is also considered extended release, but there's kind of uh, an immediate release component and an extended release component that you can see here in this picture. In terms of the difference between the two, I would say the extended release in general, it's, uh, absorption is a little bit erratic, so it's a little bit hard to predict. Sometimes the first dose will not really be well absorbed, and so patients will be off, and then that with the next dose, like basically two doses will be absorbed and then they'll become really dyskinetic. So I would say in general, it's not really the best medication, in my, in my opinion, for uh, for kind of treating these fluctuations. The Ritari is a little bit more reliable in doing so. However, you know, I have, I have a subset of patients who do like the Ritari, who do feel like it really helps with the fluctuations. But I do have a subset of patients that still prefer the immediate release. Um, they just feel like it kicks in better and it uh, has more of a boost. So it's, Ritari is definitely worth a try if, if someone's experiencing, uh, experiencing fluctuations, but um, you may have to work with it. And the, do and the dose conversion actually is a little bit confusing. It may not it's, not, it's not completely set, so you may need to make adjustments and kind of work with it. But um, Ritari definitely uh, is a mainstay for motor fluctuations. Um, and then I just want to highlight Divi as well, which is a, a fairly new uh, formulation. Um, basically what it is, is it allows you to um, cut the pill into fourths instead of just half. That situation's helpful. For example, there's some patients that are very, very sensitive and say one tablet causes dyskinesias, but half a tablet, you know, isn't very effective. You can actually do three fourths of a tablet. And so maybe that strikes a good balance between um, being effective, but not causing dyskinesias or other side effects. And then in terms of um, other adjunctive medications, so the mo mono, um, it's basically MAO-B inhibitors and the COMT inhibitors, um, they reduce the breakdown of dopamine. So they are kind of enhancing the effect and should always be used in addition to uh, 
and generally should be used in addition to the cinnamet. But sulfinamide is, is one of the newer ones. Adago is the other name. I, I personally don't use that one a lot, but potentially could be used to help with wearing off. Opicapone or Ongentis um, is also a newer formulation, very similar to Intacapone or Comtan. Um, Intacapone, you know, you need to take that with each dose of Levodopa, but the Opicapone can be given once a day, which is a little bit more convenient. They do report that, you know, maybe it's a little bit better tolerated. I found it's kind of mixed from that standpoint. One thing that's not quite on here, but amantadine. Um, there is a newer uh, formulation of amantadine, which is called Gokovri, which is a long-acting version. So amantadine, usually we give it two or three times a day, and the Gokovri can be given once. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, maybe it causes, uh, it, it's a little bit better tolerated in terms of uh, side effect profile. And then um, the other one I want to highlight is um, estradepilin or Nurians. Um, it's an interesting medication. It actually acts on the same receptor as caffeine. I've used that one as well, kind of for wearing off, for freezing of gait sometimes, and, and I have found it to be helpful in some situations. So um, I do tend to like to try that medication. And then just to touch on non-oral therapies, you know, the subcutaneous levodopa pump is not yet approved, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, and I'll do that in the next slide. And the newer medications on this, uh, the rest of the slide are the sublingual apomorphine, which is Kenobi. Or the and the levodopa powder that's inhaled that's called Embrisia. Those medications in general are kind of what we call rescue therapies. So they have a fairly rapid onset, like 15 to 30 minutes, and um, but they do last for short periods of time, so maybe like an hour. And the purpose of that is, you know, to bridge patients sometimes, like in between, um, you know, if they wear off early, they can kind of rescue, uh, use a rescue in that situation. Um, maybe their meds just aren't kicking in, they can use it in that situation or sudden offs, kind of unpredictable situations where you kind of need something just as needed to help. I have found that for the, you know, the Embrigia, patients do have some difficulty with the inhalation part of it, um, which makes it a little bit hard to tolerate, but people that can get it to work um, do tend to like it. And then the Kenmobi is sublingual. I didn't really touch on this, but just because apomorphine is a dopamine agonist, in general, dopamine agonists, um, I think we're kind of shying away from those medications in general as a community. I have certainly since the beginning of my training, more so because they can cause a lot of side effects and they really aren't as effective as uh, carbidopa levodopa. So I tend to shy away from dopamine agonists in general. Okay, so just to briefly touch on the subcutaneous levodopa pump, um, there have been Several studies. So one study um, was published in the Lancet Neurology, which is a really high impact journal. It's basically it works similar to like a diabetic pump, but it's just right under the skin. And um, basically in this graph, you can see the red represents the infusion. And then the green is just regular oral uh, carbidopa levodopa. And as you can see with the infusion, patients achieve uh, more on time without troublesome dyskinesia. So higher here. And then lower here, so they actually have less off time in general. That, that study was completed, and then um, we actually have a clinical trial. It's not recruiting anymore, but ongoing here um, for another subcutaneous pump. Um, so that data should be published you know, in the next few years, and hopefully the FDA will approve it. Um, and it'll be a really good alternative to other kind of infusion therapies and DBS as well. I will say, you know, there are some kind of dermatologic issues with the pump. Um, obviously, it's like a very small needle there, basically, that's infusing and cause some bruising and nodules. But, um, but overall, uh, we will, it seems like the results are, are good, at least based on the first trial. And then I wanted to briefly, before I go uh, on to DBS, just kind of present the, uh, another newer alternative, which is MRI-guided um, focused ultrasound. So it uses non-invasive uh, therapeutic uh, techniques that um, basically use ultrasonic waves to heat or ablate the tissue. <laughs> How I think of it is you're kind of, you're basically burning the tissue, uh, burning, burning that area in the brain. The pros are that it's kind of, it's non-surgical technically. It's certainly still invasive. There aren't as many studies, but um, the short-term outcomes have been shown to be comparable to DBS. Cons are that it's kind of a permanent irreversible lesion. If you develop side effects, those can be permanent. You can't adjust it. There are, so the main thing for me, because I, I usually do not recommend this to Parkinson's patients, 
Um, there's a few targets that have been approved. One of them is a target called the thalamus and that treats tremor only. So for most patients, you know, they have other symptoms other than tremor. And so it's just really not helpful to just treat the tremor component of it without treating stiffness, slowness, anything like that. Um, now it, it used to be only unilateral for that target. Now actually you can do it bilaterally. It has to be staged, but, but again, you're not solving a lot of the other issues. Another target, it's called the globus pallidus interna, which we do for DBS. That one is only approved for unilateral use. And that could treat some of the other symptoms of Parkinson's, such as dyskinesias. Problem is most people have disease on both sides. So it's, it's just not helpful to do just one side. Um, we don't have you know, long-term outcomes for this. It's a newer technology. There's less expertise. So actually Cedars did just get a machine. So um, we will start doing this, but I expect most of us are bringing, gonna be using it for primarily a central tremor and still pursuing DBS instead for Parkinson's. Okay, moving on to DBS. Um, so DBS in general, there are two major indications for Parkinson's. So number one is what we kind of already discussed, motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, because the DBS is good at, again, there's different targets and that gets a little bit complicated and that's something that your neurologist will decide on, but you can suppress dyskinesias, which is really important. Stimulation can provide kind of like a more consistent effect of uh, of treatment. So even, you know, without the medications, typically people, Patients do still stay on medications, but it kind of helps smooth things out. Um, and then the other major scenario where we use DBS is um, there are there is a subset of patients um, whose tremor does not respond to medications. And so in those patients, DBS is really helpful. And the nice thing about it is it, it can be changed. It can be stopped. If there's issues, we can adjust it if you have side effects. So that's kind of the difference compared to the focused ultrasound. And there are numerous, numerous studies that have really shown uh, that it does provide more on time reduced off time. Tremor responds really well to DBS, even in patients um, whose tremor does not respond to levodopa. But for the, the remaining symptoms, we really want, um, we want to select patients whose symptoms in general, again, exception of tremor, that respond really well to, to levodopa. Um, rigidity, bradykinesia, dyskinesia is all of those things. Because we, we just want to set expectations. We, we don't want to tell people that, you know, other things, which I'll kind of move on to here, for, like balance, freezing of gait, you know, if these things clearly respond to levodopa, then potentially, yes, it can respond to the DBS. But those are things that do tend to actually progress with the disease and, and become harder to treat. So if a patient's main complaint is their gait and balance, and those symptoms don't respond to medication, then that may not be an ideal candidate for a DBS. Um, and other things like speech may not improve, swallowing, um, non-motor symptoms as well. Things like, you know, some people actually have non-motor off, so they'll experience some anxiety, shortness of breath, and things like that when they're off. That's not something that I would guarantee would respond to DBS. Now, if the issue with taking more medication, like if those symptoms respond to medication and we can suppress dyskinesias so that we can increase the medication further, then in that situation, maybe we can actually treat some of these non-motor symptoms with DBS. So in general, um, good DBS candidates are um, patients who have had Parkinson's disease more than four years. Now that number isn't set necessarily, but it, you know, patients who have had Parkinson's for a longer period of time tend to have motor fluctuations. There's kind of ongoing talks about, you know, for patients that whose tremor doesn't respond, to medication, you know, perhaps those patients would be good candidates to get it even earlier than that. Patients who are good surgical candidates in general, patients that don't have very significant cognitive impairment. So actually a study came out recently that did show that, um, that patients with some level of cognitive impairment do still benefit from DBS, particularly, you know, even if they might have the diagnosis of dementia, but it's on the milder side, they still could definitely benefit. But we do hesitate um, with patients who have more moderate or severe dementia. Um, as it, it, you know, the brain doesn't like to be poked. So I have seen a few cases where it does result in kind of a more rapid cognitive decline afterwards. And then as we already talked about, patients that have symptoms that improve with medication would be good candidates. So this is just button. showing an example. It turns up and you will see that the tremor begins to return to, to my right side. It affects both my 
hand and my leg. And is quite violent uh, as a result of the. And I try to do the, the testing that they always do. My left hand works fine, but my right hand is, is out of control. Same thing with my trying to touch touch my nose, or I flip my hand back and forth, as I'm sure you've already tried yourself. The activation of the unit puts us back on, and you see the cessation of the tremor and the calming effect it has on the rest of my body. Susie, you can see it can be very effective. Um, just showing a patient, and presumably this patient, um, their gait issues respond well to medication. Just to briefly go over the procedure. So basically, um, you know, you have a, a wire that's, or a lead that's kind of going into the brain is connected externally uh, through another wire to a battery in the chest. Basically what we do is we kind of connect to the battery and we adjust settings to send signals um, into that area of the brain, depending on what target you selected. I did want to point out, I think somebody had uh, put in a question um, whether or not uh, you can get have a pacemaker as well. It's kind of a similar device and they can interact. In general, you can, um, you just need to have them a certain distance apart. And oftentimes that's kind of easiest achieved by having pacemaker on one side of the chest and, and the DBS battery on the other side. So in terms of the actual procedure, the surgery, um, it's done by a neurosurgeon, so definitely not me, but typically we get really in-depth imaging ahead of time uh, with MRI so that we can plan a very specific trajectory for uh, the lead to go. Um, that's because we want to avoid things like blood vessels that can cause, you know, if you poke them, that would cause, you know, bleeding and things like that. So we plan it very, very carefully with the, with the neurosurgeon. And then that kind of helps us develop coordinates for when we put um, the patient's head in a frame so that it's, you know, kind of fixed in a very specific spot and they're able to go in exactly at a specific angle. Um, the lead is implanted. And then um, in terms of making sure we're in the right spot, there's a number of different ways that we do that. Um, we measure electrical signals while we're in there. We also do imaging uh, intraoperatively as well. Um, and then we actually, usually a neurologist is there uh, in addition, and we do some testing. So we actually, most of the time, don't put you completely asleep. You're kind of on lighter sedation so we can wake you up and do some testing. Um, not, I mean, I would say mainly to make sure we're not causing any side effects that would result in us wanting to move the lead. Um, more so than, you know, sometimes you can get an immediate effect, but, um, but it's more so just to make sure we're not causing any issues. And then the lead is secured and closed. This is usually are monitored um, overnight in the hospital just to make sure you're doing okay and you can be discharged the next day. Sometimes this is done both sides at once. Sometimes it's done one side and then you come back to the other side. So that's kind of dependent on discussions with the neurologist and neurosurgeon. And then the second stage of the procedure is getting the battery implanted and connected to the lead. This is typically kind of an outpatient surgery. You can leave the same day. And then from the neurologist standpoint, um, we usually wait three or four weeks before actually programming. 
that's just because we want the brain to heal um, before we kind of uh, settle on certain settings. It's a much longer visit just because we go through a bunch of different settings and we kind of decide which one's the best, which one's the most effective, um, and which one is not causing any side effects. Um, but the overall process, you know, takes time. It can take months to find kind of the optimal settings. And so you'll come back to clinic um, a few times and we can make adjustments. Um, and majority of patients will need to continue on medications, but depending on the target selected, you may be able to decrease medications, but that will be a decision made with the neurologist. But, you know, overall, I haven't had any issues getting this covered, very standard to do for Parkinson's disease, at least for that indication. So coverage should not be an issue. Side effects. So it is a brain surgery. So there, there are some risks. I kind of say in general with, with the procedure specifically, um, you know, out of 100 patients, maybe uh, with four of them, you may nick a blood vessel, which may cause some bleeding. And three out of those four people will not notice. Like, it'll be just something that maybe is caught on post-op imaging. It uh, doesn't clinically, uh, like nothing, basically, they don't experience any symptoms from that. Um, but one out of the four may experience symptoms, depending on where the, the bleed is. So that is certainly a risk. It's not common, but it's it is something that's possible. And then side effects that kind of occur from, from the stimulation. The good thing about those is, you know, they're transient, like we can always adjust the settings. So those, those things are never permanent. We, we, we are trying to find settings that do not cause any issues, basically. In general, you know, we, because as part of the process, we do neuropsych testing ahead of time, you know, to check a patient's cognitive status, psychiatric status. You know, we're, we're trying to screen out patients that are at risk for kind of decompensation uh, because of the procedure. But those are potential risks that you could have some cognitive worsening, some psychiatric worsening as well. But again, we, we try to be really good about selecting a good candidate. Um, and then to briefly kind of touch on some newer advancements to DBS therapy in general, and it's mostly in terms of, you know, um, like technical advances. So there's something called uh, directional programming. So usually when we're, we're uh, stimulating, we're basically trying to capture an area that will treat the symptoms without causing side effects. With less advanced technologies, it's been you know, quite challenging. But now um, some of the leads are segmented. So there's more areas where we can kind of steer the current. So we can kind of choose areas that are away from the areas that cause side effects and more towards the areas that um, help with the symptoms. And there have been some studies that have really shown that this has been beneficial. And then another kind of new advance um, is kind of this remote programming, which is really helpful um, with the Abbott system. Um, you know, for pa there are plenty of patients that I see that um, live far away, um, live hours away, and it's just difficult for them to get here. Um, and so now we can actually do programming remotely. Oh, yeah, it just playing. Oh yeah, it already played. Okay, um, but um, it just it just makes it easier uh, to connect your with your physician. And another thing is, you know, sometimes patients experience side effects, and we really want to change the settings, um, you know, as soon as possible. And that's something we can do much more easily with the remote programming. And there's some other advancements that are um, that are upcoming as well. There's exploration more in studies currently, but at some point, the hope is that potentially we can kind of use the leads to sense kind of the, the brain waves and what's going on there. And the program using kind of artificial intelligence can kind of then program itself and kind of adapt the therapy based on what the patient's experiencing moment to moment. That's something that's that may be upcoming and is being studied currently. So you can scan this if you want more information uh, about Abbott and DBS in general. Um, just wanted to go on to kind of discuss some further direct, uh, future directions. So as of right now, you know, all of the therapies that we have are symptomatic therapies. They're not disease modifying. They do not uh, change the progression of the disease. But we have a lot of active clinical trials, especially here at Cedar sinai um, and just some of the things that um, will be coming up uh, in the next few months. Um, we have, um, you know, they, they're, as we kind of discussed, it's, it is a, a smaller percent of Parkinson's, but 
there are specific known genetic causes of Parkinson's. Uh, the two most common are genes uh, LARC2 and GBA mutations. Um, and so, you know, the future of medicine in general is kind of personalized medicine. So we are going to be using people's DNA to kind of decide how to treat them. And so there are going to be therapies that potentially will target specific mutations. Other agents uh, targeting alpha synuclein. So that is a protein that misfolds uh, in Parkinson's. And we don't know if that's what causes the disease, if that's kind of uh, adaptive of brain's adaptation to some other process uh, and, and it's kind of a result of it. Regardless, um, you know, there are therapies that are uh, antibodies against this protein and will remove it from the brain. So those are kind of some ongoing clinical trials, similar to in Alzheimer's, um, how amyloid deposits has abnormal deposits. And, and so some of the therapies have been targeted towards that. Um, so that is something that's potentially promising. We think that neuroinflammation uh, is potentially playing a role in development of Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative disorders. So therapies targeting inflammation in general may be something that's upcoming, and we do have a trial coming up for that. And then insulin resistance has been associated with Parkinson's. And so um, there have been several trials. Um, one of them uh, we did here at Cedars that's basically looking at using diabetes medications. Um, to treat Parkinson's. So, you know, another kind of future direction in general is kind of repurposing, uh, repurposing medications that already exist and, and seeing if those can have a disease modifying effect. Another uh, thing that was, I think a few people submitted questions about it is the kind of the gut microbiome. So I just wanted to briefly talk about that. You know, there have been multiple studies, um, especially a few recently, basically showing that the bacterial makeup within the gut is different in Parkinson's patients as compared to healthy controls. For example, I think that kind of the most common ones that have come up, um, there's this bacteria called lactobacillus that exists in higher levels in Parkinson's patients um, compared to healthy controls. And then there's another one, um, I think Prevotella, that is in, uh, basically exists at, um, in lower levels in Parkinson's patients as compared to healthy controls. They think potentially the gut bacteria are related to gut permeability, they're pro-inflammatory. So as I kind of discussed, inflammation may be kind of an important component of the disease. And so it's a little bit unclear, honestly, how this translates um, clinically in terms of you know recommendations that we make to you. Um, obviously I told you about Mediterranean diet, but um, you know, for example, dairy products, tend to feed lactobacillus. So should we be avoiding dairy? Um, you know, maybe there's a little evidence for that. Uh, it's not super strong. So it's not something that I typically recommend. Um, I think there was actually a study showing in, in males that um, uh, males that uh, took in more dairy had a higher risk of Parkinson's. So I don't know, maybe there's something there. Plant-rich diet tends to increase Prevotella and that was at decreased levels in Parkinson's. So maybe increasing plant-based foods would be helpful. We already know plant-based diet in general is, is healthy. So again, I can't make, uh, these are associations or certainly it's not causation. So I, I can't uh, necessarily guarantee or even recommend necessarily going vegan and things like that. But it's something to consider um, that, you know, needs to be studied further, definitely. There also were, um, I was looking, there are a few case reports in series and that, case reports and series, meaning not randomized controlled trials, very small numbers of patients, but they received fecal transplant. So like Parkinson's patients had fecal transplant from uh, healthy controls. Um, and again, it was not a lot of patients, very, very short follow-up, but maybe there is an improvement in motor symptoms uh, in those studies. We just need more research on that in general. Things like probiotics I get asked about there's no evidence that that's going to slow the progression of the disease, but there is some limited evidence that it helps with constipation and Parkinson's patients specifically. So that is something that um, is worth trying in general. And then the other thing I think that people may have asked about biomarkers specifically. So um, there was a, a new, relatively new study that came out about this alpha synuclein seed amplification assay, which is like very long term, but um, basically, going back to the alpha synuclein, which is the protein that misfolds and aggregates in Parkinson's, um, basically they take uh, samples from blood and from spinal fluid, and they use this assay to kind of amplify it so they can see which patients have a lot of these aggregates that will develop a lot of these aggregates. It's actually very shown to be very sensitive and specific for Parkinson's. Also, is positive in patients that have 
some of the prodromal features that we talked about, people that have loss of smell, that have REM behavior disorder, that have um, also in addition like a positive dopamine scan basically. So it's clear that this is um, will be helpful. I think more so as of right now, you know, in clinical trials at kind of identifying at-risk cohorts. Although you could also say, you know, um, we already know if, if it's equivalent to you know, screening for loss of smell and, and REM behavior disorder and, and getting DAT scans, you know, it's kind of a similar mechanism. It's not necessarily something super new, I guess, but potentially could be used in clinical trials. And also, interestingly, that study showed that this assay was more often positive in patients that had GBA mutations as, a part, uh, as opposed to LARC2 mutations. So that also kind of suggests, you know, and, and those people with those different mutations actually kind of have a different clinical presentation. You know, GBA patients do in general progress more quickly than LARC2 patients and, and have a lot of more of these like non-motor symptoms. So, you know, we call all of these different things Parkinson's, but they actually may be kind of different, different entities. But I thought that was interesting as well. Also just wanted to highlight um, our movement disorders team at Cedars. We have a really big team. There's four providers, uh, Dr. Tagliati, Dr. Tan, Dr. Hogg, and, and me, um, the newest one. And we also have a really big research team, um, as well as uh, neurosurgery colleagues, neuropsychology colleagues, um, and we have very active like basic science uh, research going on as well um, in neuroimaging and, and uh, neuroscience as well. I think I still left a little bit of time if anyone has any questions, try to cover as much as possible. And uh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Malat. The first question, doctor, if Riteri does not eliminate off periods, is there a downside to going back to ERCL? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I would say, again, in general, I personally have found for the extended release carbidopa levodopa that, you know, it's just not as reliable in terms of uh, on and off time, but there's there's no, there's no not a downside to going back. Um, yeah, I mean they're all kind of different alternatives. I, I'll actually for me personally, um, more often I use the extended release tablet um, with patients that can't tolerate the immediate release for some reason, like they're experiencing a lot of side effects. I have found that they tend to tolerate the extended release a little bit better. Um, I think just it's not quite as quite as much of a boost or it's not quite as strong. And so that's kind of the situation where I've used extended release. Um, and then the Ritari I've generally used to um, help with the motor fluctuations. Thank you, doctor. Here's our next question. I have the Duopa pump. If approved, will I be able to move to this? Uh, yes, so the Duopa pump, I didn't talk a lot about, but that's the intrajejunal pump. It's a little more invasive, it goes right into the stomach there. Um, so yeah, that, Technically, that could be removed, and um, you could go to the subcutaneous pump. Um, I guess my only caveat would be, I'm not sure in terms of um, the infusion rates. Um, as of you know our current study, there is a limit on how much can be infused. Um, I think it was like, maybe it's like 700 milligrams or something um, that can be infused uh, during the day through the subcutaneous pump. And I'm not sure if, actually, I'm not sure because I personally actually don't use the Duopa pump a lot. Um, I, I tend to do DBS more frequently, but um, I'm not sure about the infusion rates, um, if there's going to be an equivalent. But um, for some patients on the subcutaneous pump, they do actually still have to take oral. So I'm not sure if you're also taking oral with the Duopa pump. But, but yeah, you could switch. You can remove the, the Duopa pump and, and do the subcutaneous one. Okay, and here's our final chat question. Does DBS help with brain fog and is brain fog a precursor to dementia? So brain fog, um, so uh, I kind of discussed in general that DBS is used to treat motor symptoms that respond well to medication. So um, brain fog, I would consider a non-motor symptom. So I, I certainly would not do DBS for the brain fog, and I certainly like wouldn't guarantee that it would help with the brain fog. Um, in general, with some of the cognitive outcomes, um, I think it's been mixed. Like some studies have shown maybe a little bit improvement in cognition, and some have shown some worsening in certain aspects of cognition. But again, it's uh, it's it's not something I would ex necessarily expect. Um, it's possible that it could help. 
if it is a symptom that responds to medication and you know if we need more medication uh, and the DBS can suppress dyskinesias and potentially that could help. But again, it, it's, it's certainly not anything that I would typically expect or kind of uh, advise patients on uh, that it would improve that. And then is brain fog a precursor to dementia? So there's a spectrum of cognitive impairment in Parkinson's um, ranging from just kind of mild like you know, brain fog or mild kind of cognitive complaints early on in the disease, things like slowed processing or some word finding difficulty or just some speech, you know, kind of stuttering and things like that. Um, so those things can occur uh, without any functional issues and, and patients do pretty well, but they just kind of have that feel of they just have a little bit of cognitive issues. Then the next kind of uh, part on the spectrum is like MCI or mild cognitive impairment, where there's a clear impairment in, you know, certain cognitive aspects, you know, memory, attention, um, again, processing speed, um, kind of executive function. So like decision-making, multitasking, things like that. Um, but they don't impact your ability to function. So you're still able to be independent. So that's kind of MCI. And then dementia is, um, you know, defined as when a patient can no longer be independent. Um, and they need help with certain daily activities and things like that. In general, these numbers are, I think these are the numbers that I, that I had read, you know, maybe five years out from the disease, maybe 30% of people will have dementia. I think maybe um, 15 years out, maybe it's like, uh, actually 10 years out, maybe it's like 50%, 15 years out, maybe 80%. Um, again, this is, these numbers vary as well because people get Parkinson's at different ages. And if you get it when you're 80, then obviously you're already susceptible to cognitive decline. But there is that spectrum. And dementia is unfortunately something that is not unexpected down the line. Um, is brain fog a precursor? I mean, it, again, it's on that spectrum. I, I don't think that it necessarily predicts when, you know, when you're going to have further cognitive decline. You could continue to have brain fog um, and I'm assuming brain fog is fairly mild. You could continue to have that for a long period of time. Um, but, you know, if someone complains of that, there are things that I always want to check to make sure it's not something reversible. So, you know, low vitamin B12 can definitely cause cognitive issues. Medications, you know, certain medications can cause cognitive issues. Sleep, poor sleep, definitely. Sleep apnea, all of those things can contribute to brain fog. So, if I hear that complaint, uh, the main thing is I want to make sure there's not a reversible cause or a different cause that we can address separately. I have a question. Okay. Okay. Um, my question is, you said that you try to determine if people are going to be at risk for cognitive decline before you do DBS. What are those, what would you identify as a risk factor? Like, because I have outpatient clients and I'm, I would be interested in recommending them DBS, but I don't want to even give them false hope for, hey, you should try DBS if it's like, there's a, a contraindication that maybe I could like kind of head off. In terms of doing that assessment, we do very extensive neuropsych testing. We do like a comprehensive neuropsych eval. There's only so much I can do in the clinic. Um, you know, I can do basic screenings, but really we rely on that very extensive testing. Um, and so they, uh, especially our neuropsychologists here are really great. They really give us a good idea of, um, you know, the extent of the cognitive decline, what cognitive domains are affected. Also a really nice thing that they do is um, they're able to kind of tease out if depression and anxiety are playing a big role in the cognitive issues um, because people with depression obviously can have like pseudo dementia. They can, they can seem like they have cognitive impairment when they don't. And so they help to tease that out. Um, and then they kind of provide us with a recommendation about whether or not a patient is a good candidate. Um, and sometimes it's, it's a kind of back and forth discussion um, because there are certainly patients who have levels of cognitive impairment that would still benefit from DBS. And so it really needs to be considered kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. But, but yeah, it's ex extensive neuropsych testing. Uh, usually it's like a half day. It's, it's pretty long, it's, but it, it's very helpful. Thank you again, Dr. Malat. And thank you for joining us today. We have some great events coming up next week. We'll be joined by neuropsychologist who will talk to us about staying connected to friends, family, and community while living with Parkinson's. Next month, we'll have a presentation about eye issues and Parkinson's. Links to register for these events as well as updates for our programming will be sent out after. Feel free to join our email list if you're not already a member. Again, today's event was made, pos made possible by our sponsor, Abbott. Thank you very much.
and by you. Please consider donating to PCLA so you can help us in our mission to improve the lives of families in our community who are living with Parkinson's. PCLA is a nonprofit and all donations are tax deductible. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider making a donation at PCLA.org to help us continue. As always, feel free to reach out to us with questions. Our email address is info at PCLA.org. Or if you prefer, we have a phone number that we can be reached at. It's area code 310-880-3143. Thank you everyone for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you.